to summarize, where are we? Uh, commercial software is not very accurate and has a race problem. Humans are the same. Uh, we have a problem that we don't really understand. Why is it that a commercial software and humans are not race blind when they don't know the race of the defendant? And how is it that commercial software and paying people a couple of bucks on the internet um, are giving us the same overall accuracy? Okay. So where I left off in the previous segment was we really need to start to understand these algorithms. If we're going to get answers to those questions, we got to start by asking what do these algorithms do? I can't probe the brain. I'm not a neuroscientist. And so, but I can probe these algorithms. And in the last segment, I described to you a very, very simple, basic classifier for taking information and making a prediction about risk. And so here's what we did. We took all seven pieces of information and we built a classifier and we asked how well does it do, okay? And then what we said is, well, do we really need all seven of those? What if I only had six? What if I didn't know the sex, for example? Um, or I didn't know the age, or I didn't know the prior crimes. And then we thought, well, okay, what if we only need five? What if you only need four pieces of data? What if you only need three, two, and one? So we looked at all possible subsets of these seven pieces of information, from the full set to all subsets of size six, five, four, three, two, one. So classifier would one would only take the age and try to make a prediction, only take the sex and try to make a prediction. And then we asked, What's the best you can do? Where is the best of all of those classifiers in terms of overall accuracy? And then the hope is by looking at that classifier and what information it's latching onto, we can get answers to our questions that have been plaguing us from the beginning of this talk. And so here's what we found. It turns out that if you feed only two pieces of information, how old somebody is and their total number of prior crimes, don't care about juvenile, non felony, misdemeanor, sex, don't care about any of that. If I only have two pieces of information, the classifier that we built, the linear discriminant analysis, the simplest possible classifier you can build, was as accurate as the commercial software. So this accuracy is the average accuracy of a commercial piece of software being sold to the courts to make predictions about defendants in the court of law. This is something that Julie and I hacked up in an afternoon, right? So that's interesting for a couple of reasons, okay? And we're gonna to get to that in a little bit. Here's the most interesting part of it. So what I'm gonna show you here are the two pieces of information that we are using in our classifier. Total number of prior crimes and age. So again, this is that two-dimensional space that I was talking about earlier on. How old is somebody from young to old? How many prior crimes do they have from very few to a lot? And what this color coding is here is our prediction of risk. Yellow up here in the top corner is considered high risk, and blue in the bottom right-hand corner is considered low risk. And this is the color coding of our classifier. So once we have a classifier based on two things, it's, it's supervised learning, we train it, we can feed in any possible combination of age and prior crime, and it'll make a prediction. And then I just make that, turn that prediction into a color code and I can visualize what the prediction space looks like. And so what is it doing? Well, let's see. What it's saying is that if you are young and have a lot of prior crimes, you're at high risk. Sure, that sort of makes sense, I guess. And it's saying if you're old and have very few prior crimes, you are low risk. And of course, if you're old and have a lot of prior crimes, you're still at risk but less so than if you are young, okay? So that's what the classifier is doing. And what's nice about our linear classifier is it's interpretable. We can reason about it because we know the data coming in. We were able to show that this was the best classifier that came out of it, and we can look at this space and see, or at least intuit, what is the classifier doing? That's very nice, very positive, okay? So how does this help get at our questions? It's not race blind when it doesn't know race. This classifier doesn't know race. And how is it that it's as good as uh, paying somebody a couple of bucks on the internet? So let's go to this one first. So the problem, of course, is that prior crimes is a proxy for race. We know that in this country, for decades now, if you are a person of color, you are significantly more likely to be arrested, charged, and convicted of a crime with balancing for all other aspects. That is a largely undisputed fact in the criminal justice system. So when we were saying that the algorithms and the humans don't know about race, 
that was strictly true, but not entirely true. Because yes, I didn't tell you this person's black or this person's white, but I told you something that is a proxy for race. Because people of color, again, are more likely to be charged, convicted, charged, uh, arrested, charged, and convicted. And therefore, looking at the number of prior crimes is an, a, a peek into their race. Again, it's a proxy. So this, just the understanding that total number of crimes was, the, in addition to age, was the single most important predictor gives us some insight into this race problem for both the algorithms and probably for the humans as well. I mean, there's really no other explanation if you don't know the race of the person. And we know that humans were probably doing something very similar to this as well. Now let's get to this question. How is it that AI and a random internet user are basically the same accuracy? Well, the answer is that it's a really simple classifier. So think back to when you were looking at those few, and that's why I showed you those examples. What were you doing, right? I mean, if you saw somebody who was 45 and had zero prior convictions, do you really think they're going to go out and commit a crime in the future? Does that seem reasonable to you? Or do you think, ah, they did something stupid and they got caught? As opposed to a young kid who's 20-something and has 13 prior convictions. That person, clearly, something is going on in their life. And so basically, the reason why these algorithms and the random internet users are the same is that we're doing something very simple. We intuit, we believe, we infer that basically what people are doing is saying the same thing our classifier is saying. If you're young, with a lot of prior convictions, you're high risk. If you're old, with very few prior convictions, you're low risk. That explains two things in one. Why internet users and this AI are basically the same accuracy and also where the, race, the lack of race blindness comes in because this access prior crimes is a proxy for race. All right, you can say, well, who cares? Who cares that the AI and the random internet user are exactly the same? I mean, at least, at least they're not worse. And so why not use the AI um, and take the human out of the loop? Well, I would argue, however, there's a little bit of a problem with that. And that is because of the sense of authoritarian voice. So what do I mean by that? Imagine the following scenario. Imagine you're a judge. And uh, you have a defendant before you. And they're being asked uh, to be released on bail. And the court tells you, hey, we have this sophisticated AI system built on big data and the latest advances in deep learning. Um, and, we, and it's a commercial product. We paid for this thing, which obviously associates value with it. And it said that this person is high risk you would think the judge would at least give some credence to that. Yeah, like yeah, that would sound authoritative. Now imagine a different scenario. Same defendant, same question, bail or no bail. And uh, the lawyer says, well, somebody on the internet tweeted that this person is high risk. Do you think the judge would care at all what a random person on the internet said? Of course not. That's not authoritative, what somebody on Reddit or Twitter or Facebook said. I don't care. And yet, the accuracies are exactly the same, and the mistakes are the same. And so when you, when you wrap things around these AI boxes, they seem authoritative. And if they're authoritative, you give more credibility to that, even if it doesn't deserve it. So I would, I would argue it still matters, even though that these accuracies are the same. Now, here's a really interesting question is, I remember I told you we built this really dumb, simple classifier. Right? So can we do better? Now we're going to get back to the original question that Julie and I set out to do. So all of this was in some ways like just, you know, what is going on here? Why are these things racially biased? What is the baseline? Once we figured out the baseline, we're like, well, why is there bias in the first place when they don't know race? And I think that we've probably unraveled that. We've gotten to the bottom of that. It's an incredibly simple classifier, and we have a proxy for race in terms of the total number of uh, priors. So I think we have a good understanding of now of the space. And now the question is, can you get rid of bias, and can you make the, the accuracies better? Okay, so let me just talk very briefly about some of the work we've done on that. So the first thing we asked is, well, what happens if we go from a linear classifier, the simplest possible classifier you can build, to a nonlinear classifier? And without going into the details of it, a nonlinear classifier basically allows you to build not just a, a line through the space, but a, curvy, a curve that allows you to carve out exceptions, right? So here you can see, for example, I'm carving around here so I have more of the yellow points down below and more of the red points above. So these are called nonlinear classifiers. 
support vector machines, neural networks, deep learning, all of those fall into that category of nonlinear classifier. And just one nonlinear classifier that we built was really, really disappointing. Again, this is the overall accuracy of the commercial software, 65%, our human, 64%. The linear classifier, that, the LDA that we've already talked about, was 66%, and the nonlinear was 65%. They're all exactly the same. We just seem to be stuck at around 65%. Okay? I posit, I cannot prove, but I posit, I think that this is a fundamentally hard problem, and I am unconvinced that you can actually do better than this. Because think about what you're asking the algorithm to do. You're asking it to predict the future from a relatively small amount of data and the future two years in advance of a fairly complex set of socioeconomic, personal, and just, you know, what is random dumb luck going to happen in somebody's life? And I don't think that's a stretch of the imagination to say that this is really hard. So here's a question for you. Should we even be doing this? Should we actually be trying to predict whether somebody's going to commit a crime in the future and then incarcerate them if we think that they are, if the accuracy is 65%? What if the accuracy is 75%? What if it's 85%? What if it's you? What if it's somebody you love? Do you want this algorithm being applied to somebody with this kind of error rate? What's an acceptable error rate? Are these things really better than humans? How do you deal with the bias? Nobody has good answers to these things. So here's a question. Now I come back to the title, right? Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. And as you enter into what is undoubtedly an incredibly exciting time for us in terms of computation and AI and data and the impact that we can have on the world, we have to start thinking about what are the negative aspects of what we are doing. Should we be trying to make these decisions? And if we do, the answer may be yes, but then are they accurate? Are they fair? Do they disproportionately affect women, people of color, LGBTQ community, uh, people who are not born in this country, people who aren't native speakers, whatever it is? We have to think about the consequences of that. We have spent the last 20 years with the mantra of move fast and break things. And while lots of good things have come from that, some really bad things have come from this. Bias in algorithms for hiring, bias in algorithms in healthcare, bias for algorithms in financial sectors. Bias for algorithms in the criminal justice system. Bias in facial recognition. We've got to tread lightly here. And what that means is you can't come at this after the fact. You can't develop, deploy, and then debug on the fly. This isn't a word processing software. If you have a bug, somebody loses a document. This is the wor real world where you make a mistake and somebody's sitting in jail or somebody doesn't get a home loan, or somebody doesn't get a small business loan, or somebody doesn't get a job or go to the university. We are impacting real people's lives with our algorithms and our data. And if we don't understand these things, we have the potential to do way more harm than we do good. And so the free-for-all of the last two decades, in my opinion, should be over. And I, and I, and I want to emphasize that I'm not anti-technology. I'm not saying don't do things. I'm not saying don't innovate. But I'm saying think. Think carefully about the consequences of what you're doing and make sure that there is transparency, there is fairness, and there is accuracy in how these technologies are being used. And more generally, making sure that you understand how your technologies can be misused as well. Because almost all technologies have benefits and drawbacks, and we have to start thinking about those things up front and simply try to mitigate the harm while harnessing the phenomenal power of technology and AI and data. All right, I'm done. I hope you enjoyed this, and I hope you learned something from it, and uh, we'll see you soon.